Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's discussion. Thank you to the Haitian American Caucus, 67th Precinct Clergy Council, and the Mayor's Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes for sponsoring this discussion around bias and discrimination in Black maternal health. This is going to be an insightful, uh, open dialogue about biases and discriminations in Black maternal health um, with two amazing speakers. And I will be facilitating the, this conversation. My name is uh, Esther Debbie Lewis, and everyone calls me Debbie for short. And um, we will be bringing in our speaker shortly, and we will be. Int I'll introduce myself again, as well as the speakers. All right. So thank you again to our sponsors for tonight's uh, conversation, and we will begin very shortly. All right. Hi. 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 That was thirsty. <laughs> the camera always catches us on the red one. Stay thirsty. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Again, thank you to our speakers for tonight's. Uh, am I giving feedback? Yeah. Okay. Tamar, can you see if you can mute and see if that helps? All right. Is this better? You can just give me a thumbs up. It's better. Okay. So, again, thank you to Haitian American Caucus, 67th Precinct Clergy Council, and the Mayor's Office. Um, for the prevention of hate crimes for this uh, conversation tonight and for sponsoring. I am joined this evening by uh, Tamar Innocent, uh, a woman's health coach uh, who's absolutely amazing, who has helped um, bring enlightenment on several topics uh, in which we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, also uh, by the amazing Nerlene saint May who is a registered nurse and an advocate for women's health um, and birthing rights, right? And so I'm excited to have all of you here um, and really dig deep into this conversation. So um, we're just going to start out. This is going to be very casual. I uh, will ask the audience, if you do have questions, go ahead and drop the questions mm -hmm in um, the chat box. We will answer them as they uh, pop up as we move on from topic to topic, okay? So I just want to go ahead and just briefly introduce myself, which will lead into the first question. So um, I am a organizer and an educator, uh, and I am a new mom. My baby is officially eight weeks, and time is like flying by. Um, although it felt so slow in the beginning, but now it's just flying. So um, my pregnancy journey actually started um, with this conversation under this first, the very first episode that we had. I was actually pregnant and navigating pregnancy through COVID. And I think that was our topic. And it was very, very difficult. Um, that first through that first conversation, I miscarried, but I was also educated on how to navigate that process based off of the conversations that we have had here. And, um, you know, Nerlene and Tamar, just based off of them, just downloading information into me really helped me um, process what was going on and how to navigate you know, the hospital and navigate my body changes and all these other things, because it was a very, very difficult time, especially with, you know, it being a, a first pregnancy. So um, what I want to say, 
the question that I want to pose to you both, and this is something that I've been hearing and seeing uh, throughout this journey and looking at, you know, when Instagram kind of just like spams you because you look at one topic and then your whole feed is that whole topic. And so I've been seeing this and I kind of want to get some insight from both of you. So there is a stigma out there that states that if you do not have the best insurance, that dictates the quality of care that you will receive during your pregnancy journey, during the prenatal journey. Now, is this something that is accurate? Is this, you know, just, you know, fictitious and made up? Um, is this something that we should be aware of? And how do we navigate this as a bias, as Black women um, who are looking to actually conceive and be on a very healthy and positive journey with our providers? And I guess, Nerlene, maybe you can answer this first because maybe you're, you know, you're in the trenches. Uh-oh, she has something to say. <laughs> You can unmute. Yeah, yeah so I re realized that. Like, oh. <sighs> yeah. Uh, well, your insurance does does dictate, um, you know, the provider that you have. Not every provider accepts, you know, every insurance. Um, and some, you know, there are differences between insurances and what they cover, um, you know, and the benefits that you will receive. Um, it depends. I can't just say yes, but it can depend. It can dictate if you get this provider or that provider because one of you know they may not accept your insurance. Thank you. So there's a couple of ways to answer that, right? Um, you have. So when I I had my son really really young and I had Medicaid, right? Um, cause I had just graduated college. I didn't have a real job yet. Um, and I thought I was living the life. Like I got everything I needed. And in New York, you can have, um, once, once you're pregnant, you, you, you can, um, get healthcare. Um, so that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and I had Medicaid and so I was excited. Sure. Awesome. But then you know, as I got older and I'm understanding um, just how the healthcare system works, healthcare, your, your, the, the type of insurance you have does play a role because um, let's think about fertility and how big fertility clinics are now and how much help women need nowadays to get pregnant. Fertility is very expensive. Um, and sometimes it does make a difference whether you're going to go through another round of, um, help me with the world word, uh, Darlene, but um, if, if you don't have enough, if, if you're trying to like go through more rounds of, of fer fertility trials, like it, it, it adds up. And even with great insurance, you still have women paying really high deductibles. Um, so I think insurance does play play a big role. And I've seen that in my journey um, as I gotten older and I needed better um, hospital GYN care, how um, I remember having Medicaid and I wanted this specific doctor, but she didn't take my insurance. Although she worked at two different hospitals, um, I couldn't see her in her clinic and I couldn't get an appointment with the Medicaid I had to see her um, at a um, at the hospital because the appointments was too far out. Like I was, I was, I was gonna have to like wait three or four months. Then I got a new job, switched insurances, and I was able to see her like maybe a year ago. So insurance does play a big role, and sadly, black women don't necessarily always have the best insurance. It really depends on your job um, and the benefits that they have they carry. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, you know, I've fortunate enough, I, I haven't experienced the insurance conundrum um, with navigating providers, but I know there are many people who do. And it's important thing for us. I mean, you know, like you said, graduating college and being an adult and, you know, just getting into maybe just starting work and figuring out what insurance, you know, do you want? Do you want to be 
you know, in the marketplace or do you want private insurance? I think it's a very important decision to make, not just with pregnancy alone, but with also figuring out how you're going to manage your care as a female. It's very, very important. Um, I just wanted to share a personal uh, scenario that happened to me um, during, I guess like, you know, the tail end of my eighth month, I actually caught COVID. I was caught in that final wave of Omicron and it was terrible. It was, I mean, I felt like I was going to die. I felt like I was about to give birth, but I was, even though I was, you know, in active labor, it wasn't nearly, um, I wasn't nearly ready to, you know, give birth just yet. And I actually spent four weeks in active labor. But with that being said, um, that was traumatic enough. Uh, I was just watching how even, you know, testing negative, I, I end up testing negative like 10 days after but I watched how other women in the hospital uh, tested positive for COVID and how they were treated. I believe that there was a level of discrimination um, that was happening in the hospitals based off of the providers. Some providers, um, you know, were very uh, warm at your bedside, you know, and then there were some who, you know, they just slipped you food through the door and they stayed six feet apart from you, still in hazmat suits and said, are you okay? Okay, great. See you later. Um, and, you know, just listening to some of these stories, watching it, you know, and looking at these, these doors in the hospital, like sealed off. Um, I believe that there was a level of discrimination based off of, you know, catching COVID. Uh, COVID was, you know, wasn't, you don't go outside and just say, Hey, give me hope. Hey, I want it. I want it. Please me. Right. You, it, it comes, you don't know how you get it. You touch a doorknob, somebody sneezes, whatever it is. And so there's a lot of discrimination that I've seen with this in the past uh, few months. Now that it's completely slowed down, how can we navigate, you know, new variances, um, maybe, um, you know, other diseases as, you know, black women in the in coming in to get healthcare uh, and coming in to get services. How do we navigate coming into the hospital or going to see a provider and ensuring that we are not being discriminated based off of what is happening externally? So extrinsic uh, factors. How can we ensure that our providers are not going to discriminate us based off of what's happening externally? So Nerlene, I'm not sure what the process is in the hospital or, you know, in private uh, facilities, but how, how do you all figure out how to navigate after COVID, right? After these big surges? Um, and how do you provide care to individuals who are coming in who are sick and who didn't just go out and say, hey, COVID, pick me? Um, that's a good question. I mean, every facility you go to will have their, you know, have their own protocols relating to COVID. Um, and, you know, that's something that um, they should, they usually have it posted on there. They do share it with patients, what their protocols are. Um, I know if you're going to an appointment or a visit to a clinic, they will, they will tell you that, you know, if you are experiencing symptoms that are suggestive of COVID infection, you should not come in. You, uh, you know, you let them know some uh, doctors, they can do a televisit, you know, if it's not something that's, you know, too serious. Um, and if, you know, you can stay home and wait till you get better and reschedule your appointment. Now, if you're in a facility and you're hospitalized and you have COVID and you're, you know, you're pregnant, yes, they, I'm not going to lie. I've seen it. Um, and there's that, you know, and especially, you know, in, especially in um, when, you know, there were outbreaks and it was at the height, you know, that, you know. I have people who reach out to me and they exactly what you're saying. Um, they felt they were being discriminated against. Um, there was the, you know, like a stigma um, against them. Um, now that it's dying down, we still have to take precautions. Um, you know, they try to limit the interactions with the patients they do. Um, and if the patient is feeling uh, you know, marginalized. The patient's feeling like, you know, I'm not getting the attention that I need, or I'm not, you know, being heard because, you know, of my infection. Um, they should voice that. 
um, they should let that, you know, let them let their nurse know. They should, you know, find if there's an advocate on the floor, let them know what's going on. But I don't think that you should feel like you can't say something. Um, and sometimes we don't real, um, you know, realize that we're treating people a certain way. We don't, we're trying to stay away because you want to be safe. The main thing is to maintain the safety of the patient and the staff. But if you feel a certain way of how you're being, you're being treated, you should voice that. Um, because the person, the you know, the nurse or doctor may not know it. Um, but yes, they they may have the hazmat suits on. They have the mask on. We're we're donned to the T, um, and it's you know for safety. But definitely voice the concerns and voice how you're feeling. I remember my doctor coming in. And, um, she just had the hazmat suit, mm -hmm. and she just I like that movie. right. Um, and the little, yeah, the littlest touch can, you know, make the difference. Like, you know, I'm here, you know, you're heard. Sometimes some, you know, patients just want to be heard. Let them, you know, let them vent, let them say what they have to say. Let them get it out. Yeah. I think that makes the difference. Where my particular problem is what I've been with care, mm -hmm. uh, I know that other people are the same thing, you know. But I, I just want to ask Tom a question. What are the key words that you can't use? Oh, Nerling, can you mute? Thank you. Tom, what are some key words or some ways that we can speak to our providers and ask for more support or voice our current state of feeling uncomfortable with how the services is being provided to us? To be honest, exactly the way you just said it. Um, I think sometimes we feel like there's this magic words or magic, like, you know, your provider walks in and you let them know and you say as, um, as, as well as you can and as nice as you can too. Um, Cause sometimes I feel and I'm usually gun ho for my patients and my clients, but <laughs> sometimes we come off a little strong. And those doctors and nurses, they are tired. They have been working 12 hour shifts and, you know, especially in labor and delivery, they're tired. Um, so, you know, be firm, yes, but also state like, listen, I don't think, I don't feel well right now and I don't like the way I'm being treated. And I would like it if, you know, um, a, B, and C happened. Um, and just having those conversations calmly. So if you need to calm down, if you, um, and especially during the height of COVID and even now during um, the Omicron surge, because I feel like I actually supported a client. Um, yes. And that was like right at the beginning of the surge. It was like right before Christmas. Um, and she was treated wonderfully, um, to be honest. Um, it, it was a good experience um, to, in that regard, I believe. And um, when she didn't like something, you know, I told her, do you like this? And she said, no. And I said, okay, breathe. And then when the doctor came back, when the nurse came back, she was able to voice and say, listen, I don't want you guys to do this, that, and the third. Um, and they kept it moving and did what they had to do. And it was fine. Um, but sometimes it's not even a matter of like, even just being upset, just get your, get what you get, how you feel out there and it'll make a difference. And if it doesn't ask for the, ask, ask for the, the nurse manager, the, um, the head nurse, then ask for a patient advocate, just ask and they will come. I think with that whole, with everything you just said. Um, I went in knowing that I should be nervous and I was like, I'm going to, you know, write out a birth plan. I'm going to get support. I'm going to have people on speed dial, right? Thinking that it was going to help speed up things. And sometimes that worked and sometimes it absolutely didn't because things were moving very quickly. So, so. <laughs> I love to educate and, and I think you went in with the right mindset. Yes. Absolutely. You have your, your people that you could call and do all of that. But that is why doulas go hard and say, 
do not go in the hospital without us because it is so necessary to have us because you're going to get tired. You're going to get overwhelmed. You are in pain. Your husband or your partner is there and they're just like concentrated on watching you be in pain. They're not all the way there. You're not all the way there, but you have somebody that has experience, that has the informational knowledge to know like what to say at that moment for you or like to tell you what to say. So you can't you you need a support person that's not physically or emotionally tied to you. You need like someone that that could stay sane. You need a doula. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people that all the time. I think you just just go ahead and get it. Uh, and I'll say this, you know, one of my hospital stays, I think I was on the phone with Tama for like two to three hours and she's just like, no to this, yes to this, no to this. And I was like, I'm exhausted. And because people couldn't come in at that time, you know, you can have an extra person. The rules were changing every like day or every week. It was very difficult to figure out who can come in and who can't. And so if, you know, and now that things are becoming a little bit more lax, I do encourage having that support person there. It's just like what time I explained, you know, my husband being there with me, he's just like super tuned in and focused to make sure I'm okay. And still trying to listen to what the legalese and the, the medical lease of what's happening. Right. And so but you see that that's where I'm sorry to cut you off, but that, that, that annoys me because when when during the height of the pandemic it doesn't matter what's going on in the hospital a doula is supposed to be there so that that was very wrong on the hospital's part because no matter what surge is going on you're supposed to have a support person there outside of your partner or outside of a loved one so anybody watching you get a doula no matter what in new york new york state can i ask something so um tama i know there are people have reached out to me asking how can they get a doula? And I think we covered that in the last um, conversation that we had. Um, they want to know how can they go about to get a doula? You know, I know plenty of them, but is there like a process um, or like a, a registry that they can go to to find a doula so, in that area? So one, Google is our best friend. You know, I feel like sometimes people could could uh, Google everything else, but they forget like to Google important things, right? So like Google doulas in New York, a hundred, hundreds of them are gonna come up at this point, right? But there are also some referral agencies. There's Ancient Song, um, there's the Doula Collective, <laughs> there's um, Carriage House. There's so many in Brooklyn and in New York City. Um, and I'm trying to remember like there's Manhattan Birth, um, try to. I hope my like my doula friends aren't watching, and I can't remember the names of their their referral agencies. But um, there's so many. Um, like me, I'm not necessarily, or I I don't doula anymore. I don't provide labor support anymore. But like for me, I was pretty much independent. So for someone, we use Instagram to buy shoes and clothes and cars and everything it's, just, it's the same way you could go on instagram and look up the hashtag doulas in new york doulas in brooklyn and you're gonna find you're gonna find a list of doulas um and referral um, by mouth if you have friends that were pregnant that use doulas ask them um because those those referrals are the best referrals um, when it's your friends um so if you know one like if somebody reaches out to me i got a list of like six, seven doulas that I'm going to refer you to off the back. Um, so, yeah. Does that answer the question? Uh, mine, it does, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. I, I will say this before we move forward. Um, I have, I want to say I have two, I had two doulas plus Tamar, right? And I, I'll say why. I had one who kind of helped me through the prenatal process and a, a little bit past postpartum. And then I had someone who prepared me before I even, you know, got pregnant and then postpartum. And then I had Tamar who really helped me with health and a little bit more of labor support. Um, now that she's not doing it anymore. And then even afterwards, you know, just tips on how to care for a newborn. And I think um, pulling from all three of these amazing women really helped me to not go crazy in my journey and to avoid having postpartum depression. And so I will refer, you know, any 
well, two of them in whatever time I want to do now, because I know she's like, uh, labor support, support in the hospital. No, but her coaching um, and being able to share a lot of what she knows to be supportive health wise, um, getting your body prepared, you know, things to naturally eat, um, moves to naturally do to, you know, just prepare yourself. I think all of that was super important. So one of my doulas was MILF made and the other one was Cisa Bohr and then, um, Tamar. So I would say that, but I just wanted to piggyback off of all that since we're talking about support, uh, support people being with us. Is it necessary to have a healthcare proxy? Do you think that's necessary or do you think it's really if it's more of a grave circumstance to have a healthcare proxy? And I guess any one of you can can answer. Oh, I saw the time I was on muted. I thought she was going to answer. <laughs> uh, wait, can you wait? You want to know if um, we should have a health proxy? Yeah, healthcare proxy and have like that cool form. <laughs> I think it's important to have a healthcare proxy. Um, I mean, you never know what's going to happen when something's going to happen. Um, and I don't think we're too young to have, um, you know, a healthcare proxy, or even if we don't have it actually, you know, the form, um, you know, let someone know, hey, you know, that, you know, I would like you to be my, my proxy. You know, you know, this is what I would, if something happens to me, you're my proxy. I mean, it defaults to your next of kin. If you're married, it's your spouse. Um, and then if you're single, yeah, um, if you're, you know, I guess I don't want to say underage, but if you're at a certain age, you know, it's your parents, if, you know, if you're not of legal age, um, but the false, you're next of kin, if you don't have it, um, in place. Um, so even if we may not have the formal form, you should have, ha have the conversation, um, with someone who you believe would be, you know, in the right place to, to be your healthcare proxy. But if you can do the, have the form, have it in place. Absolutely. And I, that's one of the forms that you do have to fill out as well, um, someone to make this medical decision on your behalf. Um, so, you know, something to think about if you have not and, you know, to have the conversation. Thank you. Um, just a question in regards to uh, biases in the hospital. Not sure if this is something that you both experience or have heard of, but do you find that women who like to do things a little bit more holistically or all natural face more discrimination than those women who decide to, you know, get um, more of inter have more interventions, whether that's through, um, you know, getting medicine or other types of interventions, like, you know, whatever they may be, especially with, you know, taking home placenta like that. Sometimes the, the hospitals and the nurses are like, another one, right? Another one, one of those. So what are your experiences with, with that? That's a good, good, good question. Um, that's a really good question. So that brings a story to mind. Um, I gave birth, I think I was like 23 and, um, I kind of, I feared medical and inter I did, I, I gave birth not knowing everything that I know now, right? And I won't go into my birth story, but um, I told my doctor, I was like, I don't want an epidural. And he laughed in my face. Um, and he was like, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna get it, whatever. And to let him know, I did not get epidural. I had a vaginal birth, okay? And I did not have any medical interventions outside of, well, the, the not so typical ones like um, Pitocin and stuff, but I'm, he left in my face. <laughs> so whatever. Um, and, and so I think, I think there's a, there's this idea where you're in a hospital. So just take the medicine. Like, why don't you want it? You know? And, and I, and I, I respect you and I love you, Nerlene, <laughs> but like, that's how they're trained. Like they, they can't help themselves. They have to give you something. They want to give you something. They have to intervene. The idea of a regular physiological birth to them, um, of a low risk pregnancy, a low risk birth. Like it just, I feel like it does not make sense to, to doctors and nurses. Like 
they can't believe it. Like, no, you can't give birth like this. Like, it doesn't happen like this. No, it's a lie. Like, I, I don't need you to give birth at all. Um, so, so, and then I have a story for the placenta. I've had clients where it's been a struggle to get the placenta. And there's a lot of rules uh, within the hospital system. And I, I'm, and I, I don't want to speak because I'm not sure if a midwife outside of the hospital would do the same thing. But I specifically remember a client of mine, she had um, GBS and um, they wouldn't let her go home, take the placenta home. And we were just like, what? It was a whole thing. And I can't remember if they let her go with it or not, but it was a really big issue because they said, you know, this placenta has, um, you know, back the in infection, blah, 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 blah. So maybe yeah. Nerdy, you could talk more about it, but. Oh, I was just going to say, um, GBS stands for a group B strep, you know, it's a type of bacteria. Um, it's, sorry, and it's pretty common for women to get, you know, have it when they're pregnant and they test for it. Um, and if you do, then they know they have to give you antibiotics um, and they can give it through, you know, give you the I antibiotics through IV um, in order to make sure that it doesn't, you know affect the baby. Um, but I mean, I can see if, you know, she has group you start their concern about the placenta, but you know, again, every institute has their own policies. So, and they, there could have been ulterior motives. I don't know, but. Um, they don't want people going home with they, what came out their own body. Like it just don't make sense. I mean, it does not. For me, um, I requested my placenta with my second child. I only have two, I don't have that many. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and I, re I requested the placenta um, and I honestly, I didn't get any hassle. I just told my doctor that I would want to take the placenta home. Um, they confirmed that when I went into labor, I filled out a form um, for it. Um, I didn't take it home with me after I gave birth, but I did um, get a, a letter saying that, hey, we still have your, you know, we have your placenta. It's ready. You can come and pick it up. So even I, I forgot all about it before leaving the hospital, but they sent me, you know, um, a letter reminding me, hey, we still have it for you, you know, to take home. So honestly, I didn't good. have any issues. Yeah, that's good. Because outside, when you give birth at a birthing center or, um, you know, at home, the midwife is like, what do you what do you want to do? Do you want it like the the it's just completely different. It's a 180 like. The, the midwife is just like, what do you want me to do with this? Do you want it? Do you want me to throw it out? Like, it's real easy. I'm like the hospital. They got to take it, check it, do all of this. And it's like, yo, it's my, it's mine. It's my organ. Sorry. Yeah, they do check it to make sure all the parts are there so that, you know, there's not something, you know, any remnants, um, you know, in the woman. Um, yeah. I mean, and I know other place, other countries and other cultures, they do like what the lotus birth and where they, you know, they keep the placenta, the, you know, the baby connected to the placenta and everything. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. It just goes in the trash. So, you know, uh, we know there's other things that could be done, but <laughs> we're not going to get into that, right? Or <laughs> I'm like, I spent nine months harvesting this organ. Let me figure out what I want to do with it. I'm just saying. Um, but I, I was one of those people where, you know, I had, I wanted my placenta, wasn't sure what I was going to do with it yet, but I wanted it. And I also did the cord blood banking. And they're like, everywhere I went, they're like, okay, she has this box and that box and she needs this temperature and that. And they were like, so annoyed. And I'm like, well, you could be annoyed. This is what I want. I'm paying for it. Right. So, um, but I will say this, can you all just speak to just in case, um, you know, folks are wondering what are the benefits of actually you know, taking your placenta because we spoke about GBS and leaving it if it has, you know, bacteria. And I don't know if um, some of our viewers actually know what the benefits are of taking uh, the placenta and what the options are um, for actually using it after birth. So if you can just, you know, talk about that really quickly in a minute or less. So um, to be honest, um, there isn't a lot of research on, um, retaining your placenta or, you know, there's a lot of people that take in the placenta by pill or they like chop, um, chop it up and put it in smoothies and things like that. There's honestly not a lot of research, but there is a lot of, 
how should I say this, like ancestral wisdom around it, right? So when you think about it, the placenta is something that was growing inside of your body to bring wealth, um, a, a wealth of nutrients to your baby and back to you. So it's clearly an organ filled with good stuff, right? Um, so lo like logically speaking, it makes sense if you wanted to retain your placenta and take it back in. Um, so to that regard, it does. Um, a lot of ancestral cult, like ver a lot of cultural things that they do with it, like returning it back to earth again, because it will um, bring nutrients back to the earth or back to you. So I do, as a, do as a doula, I do see its importance in understanding um, um, the culture around it and the understanding and the history, like I respect it. But scientifically speaking, there's just not a lot of research. But is it filled with honestly nutrients and stuff like that? It sure is. And, you know, you'll hear people testify about it being, they feel a lot more energetic. It's just healthier. It's my body. Like, you know, so it does make sense in that regard, but there's just not enough science to say that this is like the best thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I kept it and then eventually I disposed of it. Uh, so I initially I was going to, you know, get it turned into pills so that I can take because it says, you know, it can help, you know, with your mood and postpartum, you know, postpartum depression and, um, you know, with bleeding and, um, you know, give you like iron and all this stuff. I mean, I didn't have any health issues that I felt like it was going to help with, but I knew that what I wanted to have it because it's mine um, and they're going to throw it in the trash or they might do something with it that I don't have no idea. Um, so I wanted to have it. So, but yeah, I ended up just throwing it in the trash because I, you have to go through a whole process of to dry it up and get it turned into pills and stuff that you can take it. Um, yeah, I thought it would help with my, it says they claim it helps with your milk supply. So, you know, I thought I would do it for that, but I ended up not really doing anything with it. So this person, um, Briani Waiters, I hope I said your name right. She said, I wanted to take my placenta home, but my doctor told me I couldn't because my daughter pooped inside of me. So yeah, I wouldn't take it either either, um, because um, that means the baby's, the baby's meconium. Um, once that happens, um, I don't want to say it's contaminated, but maybe for some reason they wanted to make sure that... Um, nothing would happen if you were to ingest your placenta because once there's meconium in your water um that might mean that the baby may have swallowed it um and they could get really really sick so if they could get really sick that means something probably could have been wrong with the placenta too at that point thank you for that time i didn't know that so I was going to say, they're not supposed to tell you that, but that was good education. Um, and I'll say this, like I took my placenta, uh, my pills are still sitting in my fridge. I don't know. I haven't touched one, um, but I did also turn it into multiple things. I have a balm um, for like cradle cap and rashes and things of that sort. Um, and also I have tincture with it, which I can give to my daughter, um, I guess, when she's a little bit older, uh, cause it has like a shelf life of like 15 to 20 years, something like that. So, um, that's what I did with mine. I really want to take the pills, but I also feel very disgusting taking it. So I'm trying to get over it in my head. Cause I, I, I just, I did the wrong thing. And I, Tama tells me all the time, do not go on YouTube, stay off Google. And I went and I was just looking at the whole process and it just threw me off. Although it's very, very healthy. Um, because it's literally inside of you and this is how your baby survives for nine months. Um, yeah, I, I done messed up. So I'll leave that alone. Tom, I was like, let's talk about it. Why are you, why do you feel that way? Okay. So I have, uh, two more topics that I would like to, for us to, um, cover. And I just want to remind the audience again, if you do have questions or any comments, you can drop it in the chat and we will uh, respond to them um, right after the two topics. So we're going to just keep going. If there are questions, then we'll stop and uh, go through the questions. So I know that if you go into the hospital knowing 
um, you know, just terms and you're just well educated and equipped to navigate conversations, your providers are going to look at you like, oh, I can't just present this person with anything. Or they will be ready for a little bit more of a, um, I don't want to say pushback, but more of an open dialogue on, you know, what to expect. And so as it relates to maternal mortality, that is a conversation in which, you know, has been in the forefront, I would say a little bit before the pandemic, there has been a lot more highlights to it because it is a real thing. And I believe that, you know, women need to be equipped going in, understanding what it is, what are the risk factors and how to navigate, because I do believe that it is avoidable. And I was almost in that category. So um, I just want to ask either Nerlene or Tama, you know, how do we prepare for the maternal mortality prevention conversations? And how do we prepare ourselves to understand what it is and how to ensure that, you know, that is not our focus, right? We want healthy pregnancies. We want healthy experiences. But how do we prepare to prevent this and also how to uh, prepare to have the conversation with our providers, because it's something that's not spoken about. And then we find that it's becoming more and more common. Uh, I would say, you know, well, to prepare to have that conversation, I mean, just, I mean, first we want to have a provider who is open to having dialogues with you and you should be having conversations with your um, provider, you know, every time you're, you know, at your visits and they shouldn't be rushing you off. Um, you know, the end, I mean, I honestly feel that the provider should um, initiate these conversations, but if they are not, um, you let them know that you would like to talk about your concerns. Um, these are concerns that I have, um, you know, and you would like the time to have the conversation. Um, and I would say that, you know, if they're saying, you know, how, depending on how the visit's going, time is running short, can we plan a time in our next you know, upcoming visit where we can have this conversation? Um, because this is something that's very important to me and, you know, concerns that I have. Um, and they should be open to having the conversation. Um, but yeah, if they're not initiate, you know, initiating these type, this type of dialogue, you should definitely go ahead, you know, and bring it up. What was, what was the question again? Uh, preparing for the maternal mortality conversation and what are some ways to prevent this? Okay, so you have to you you have to have this conversation every single time you go to your doctor. You have to have this conversation way before you give birth, right? Because um, at the end of the day, we are black women, okay? And I'll say this every single time, the hospital was not meant for us. The hospital system, the healthcare system was not meant for black women, period. Okay, so we have to remind doctors that one, it is our bodies, it is our, um, we decide what's gonna happen to us and they have to get on board. Um, and so these conversations need to start even even before you're pregnant, honestly, um, when you're looking for a new a GYN, when you're looking for a new OBGYN, um, and then just being, because at the end of the day, if you look at, I, I forget, but if you look at New York City statistics, even the most educated woman, even the woman with masters, they still have um, complicated pregnancies that probably could have been avoided and they still have um, high maternal deaths. And these are educated black women. So it really doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. I, I think, it, yeah, okay, so it does matter to be educated, but it also matters to be very empowered in understanding that your healthcare is up to you. And, and these doctors, although you may not be paying them upfront, your insurance is. So you are paying for them. So they work for you. You are creating your birth team. You are creating, um, you know, your, your team essentially. So you have to 
let them know how you feel. You have to make sure your voice is heard. And if something is wrong, you got to let them know. And I think the best place to practice that is like um, Nerleen said, in those uh, um, prenatal appointments, you're going to be seeing those doctors and that practice for a while before you give birth, hopefully. So you want to keep having those conversations and don't want, don't wait till you're in labor to have these conversations. Don't wait till you're in labor to be like, my doctor's not listening to me. You should have figured that out, honestly, from like the second appointment. Um, so yeah. And then when I said that the hospital is not meant for you, if you're having a low risk birth, please consider giving birth at a hospital, um, at a birthing center or ho at home, please. Don't, don't fight me. Uh -huh. No, I'm not, no, I'm not fighting you. I'm with you. I'm... <laughs> um, listen, if, when I have God willing, when I have my next pregnancy, listen, it's, it's going to be either at home. I've told my husband and he laughs because he knows it's like, uh, um, it's going to be at, in a birthing center at home, nurse midwife, or not in a not in a hospital. I, ideally, I don't want it to be in a hospital, honestly. Um, and this but, is from a nurse, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but like you know, Tom, I said the conversation needs to you know you need to have that conversation. It's very important. And if your doctor is not listening to you, like she said, you go to another provider. Um, you know, switch. I'm sorry, that's it's the switch. You, you know, they're not listening to you. They're dismissing you acting like they know more than you because I'm the doctor and you're the patient. No, but you know, your body, you know, you know, it, it's your body. You know, if you're, you know, what's feeling feels normal um, or what doesn't feel right. Yes. You're, you know, you're pregnant, you're carrying a child, but um, women have babies every single day and our bodies are designed to since the beginning of time. <laughs> Listen, however long that's been, you know, our bodies are designed to give birth. Women labor for days. Okay, and you're in a hospital and it's been um, 12 hours and they're like, okay, we need to discuss alternatives. Um, I know with my story, I was in labor with my um, second child for 21 hours, 21 hours, 27 hours with the first, 20, well, I think 18 to 21 hours, oh, you know, it's foggy, with the second. And um, I know my doctor, is, is is not us <laughs> and um you know after a while she was like well your labor is not progressing you know we gave you the you know i i was actively my water broke at home i was in active labor um you know they gave me um the um but they gave me the pitocin to prog uh, make my you know labor progress but then that made my contractions not as strong and so she you know my labor you know at, at some point my labor stalled and so she said, well, you know, we have to consider, you know, going in for a C-section. It's been how many hours that it was. And I said to her, that's no, that's not an option for me. Um, and she said, well, you know, we're going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to make she I'm going to have to make the decision that I feel is safest um, for you and the baby. And of course, they say that because you're going to think, well, I want my baby to be OK. I want my baby to be safe. Forget me. I'm like, I want my child. That's called to be coercion. Uh -huh. Coercion. Right. Uh -huh. Yes. So, if you know. You're doped up. You have all these hormones. And of course, they use these, these key words that's going to trigger you. Um, but, you know, I also know I'm like, I know you're going to do this. I That's not going to happen. Long story short, a friend of mine is um, a nurse manager in the NICU. And she was on the floor and she, you know, just checking in on me. And she came in and I told her what was going on. She pulled the doctor aside, went into the hallway um, and had the conversation. When she came back, she said, okay, I'm going to get my colleague and we're going to help you. You know, we're going to come and, you know, we're going to work this out. Um, but after, when I spoke to my friend a little, um, afterwards, she said, yeah, I had the conversation with her. She said, you know, she's not at, she's, this is a low risk birth. She hasn't, hasn't had any issues. Yes. The labor may be, you know, would not be progressing as quickly as you would like it to, but what, why, why do you want to have a C-section? And she said, and she actually, I think kind of threatened her by saying I would call the um, her supervisor her boss to review this um you know if that's the decision that you want to make so well she changed her mind i delivered vaginally you know that everything was fine but it's yeah it's they they do these things and it's not nearly and i have a question for you after after that conversation put your put your thing on me for a second after that conversation that your colleague it was after your the conversation your colleague had with your provider at the time 
what happened, um, what was going on during your la your labor? Like what happened after that conversation happened? Um, after that conversation happened, what was I? Oh, so I was fully dilated um, and I was pushing, but she kept going back up. So I was, you know, trying, you know, trying to push, but she kept going back up. So she wasn't coming down. Um, but after the conversation, she did get her colleague and, you know, my husband was there. They propped me up and I hate it. I feel like I was laying back when I wanted to sit up and I hate that bed that they have. Um, you know, and I thought, you know, propped me up. Um, and then her colleague was standing next on my left side, pushing down on my stomach. And she was down to whatever she had to do. Yeah. Um, and while I'm pushing at the same time. So, um, yeah. And that went on for a while because I, you know, we, I was insisting I'm not going to leave. And her, the monitor was not going off or anything. Like there was something going, like her heart rate was not decelerating or anything. So um, we did that for maybe about like 10 minutes and then she came out. And then they were insinuating having a C-section or something like that? Mm hmm Okay, okay. I only asked because um, sometimes when you have someone to advocate for you, a baby comes out. A baby comes out. So, you know, you touched on Pitocin. People don't really know what Pitocin is. Pitocin is the synthetic version of oxytocin. And oxytocin is a hormone that we all have that kind of comes out when we're... Um, contracting when we're in labor and it comes out a whole lot during our postpartum period, right? Because it's the happy hormone. If you are not happy, if you're in that in love, it's like the love hormone, right? And if you're not feeling the love, you're not going to contract the way you're supposed to. Hence why the hospital is not always the best place to give birth because if your love hormone is feeling scared or if you're feeling scared and you're feeling like unsafe, like animals do, you're not going to give birth. Uh, so that was my spiel but thank you for advocacy that was another big word that we didn't talk about tonight and understanding how advocacy is so important having people there to advocate for your behalf especially as black women because sometimes they don't hear us and they need a couple of us to yell at them uh, so yeah and that actually brings us to our last and final topic which is advocacy Right. Oh, <laughs> it's perfect. And I'll, I'll just say this. Trust your body. Trust your body. Um, my birthing story is is very much so um, different. Every birthing story is different. And I will say this. The end goal is to deliver a safe and healthy baby, deliver in the safest way possible and deliver a healthy baby and have your baby here in your arms. That is the end goal. So no matter what way you deliver, um, that is okay. And I will say that, you know, I I was feeling scrutinized, you know, for that in, in the process. And a lot of what Neuralene experienced and what time I experienced is what I experienced as well. And not having advocacy um, during that process leads you to exactly what Tama was explaining, scared birth, traumatic births, and the baby feels that. And so it's important to make sure that you do have advocacy and learning how to trust your body. I remember in the end tale of um, me just being in labor, I was in the hospital for a day. I was like, you guys need to check me. I know something's happening with my body. They're like, no, we're okay. We're going to lunch. Everybody went away. And then they're scrambling, telling the doctor, come back from up the block from lunch. Like, it's two o'clock in the morning, but something's happening. And I'm like, I told you two hours ago that something was happening an hour ago and 15 minutes ago, everybody's putting their feet up. So um, when you, and it, this goes back to advocacy and trusting your body, I truly believe if I had someone, you know, by my side, besides my husband, and we were advocating for ourselves, but it's still like, you know, um, our doctor wasn't there. It was just like, you know, um, what do they call those people in the interim when they come in and uh, resident residents, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of residents. And I was just like, please don't touch me. Please don't write anything. Don't look at me. Don't you just, it was just a hot mess, but that's a whole nother day, whole nother time. That was a hot mess. But um, going back to advocacy, I will say this. Um, it took me with my first provider, uh, 
well, with my last provider. It took me six months into my pregnancy to find that provider. I was not going to settle. And I looked for people that can come with me. I went into my doctor's appointments with my notes, with my questions. I was annoying. I had sticky papers and my books with questions. I was asking, you know, Tama, reading back on or looking back on um, tape footage from things that we spoke about in the last two sessions. And so it's very important to have that. But what I, what I will say is that through some of my appointments, I did have my doula on the phone listening to what the doctor is saying. And then she would say, pause, ask the doctor for a pause. It's okay to pause. And she would say, do you understand what they just said? Because that was fast for me. I understand it. Do you understand it? And then if I would say yes, she would say, okay, if you have no questions, let them move on. They would never say, you must say this. You have to do this. This is the best way to do that. They were just simply there to advocate, inform, and educate on what's good, um, what's, you know, what, what are the best ways to do things? What are high risk things? What are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, although we spoke a little bit about this, um, I will say this, it is best to have, um, advocacy besides support your support person. We touched on this a little bit. So figuring out what that advocacy looks like, there are free advocacy groups, um, your doula can be your advocate. Some of them do not like to advocate on behalf of patients. And so it's um, important to find out what style of support your doula provides. And there are other people who are like, you know, women's health coaches like Tama um, or nurses who are on call, or who work in the hospital. Maybe you have a friend of a friend that works in the hospital like Nerly, and that person can provide advocacy to you if you agree upon it, don't just walk in and expect advocacy. And I think I did that one time and, you know, that didn't really work out. You must prepare for this. Okay. Um, and so additionally with the advocacy, um, I think we just need to talk about one more thing, which is, um, high blood pressure. I think we should just talk about that. Um, preeclampsia and high blood pressure just to wrap this up, because that is something that we have, uh, an issue with in um, the Black community, the Black maternal community with preeclampsia and high blood pressure. And so what I will ask is for preventative measures, because I do believe before you even get there, there should be some type of prevention. And so if you both have some tips on prevention for preeclampsia and high blood pressure, um, I, I would say let's close out with that. And also let's just talk about um, other ways, if I did not mention, on how to find advocates um, during your prenatal or postpartum uh, uh, phases. So two things. I want to I want to touch on the advocacy bit a little bit and understand because I kind of feel like sometimes we don't understand why we go so hard on, on on telling people to advocate for themselves. And one, there's implicit bias, right? Um, for example, when I gave birth, y'all, I know I look good. I, I'm not gonna tell y'all my age, right? I look 22, right? So can, can you imagine how I looked when I gave birth at 23? Yeah, I think, yeah, right? So I look like a 16 year old when I was given birth. So there's ageism. <laughs> there's age discrimination. There's a black woman, right? So they didn't think I was smart. I told y'all my doctor laughed in my face and said, no, you're going to get an epidural. And best to believe I did not. Um, there is, there's, okay, she doesn't seem that smart. We're just going to like do whatever we need to do. Like, And I've had young, really young patients, uh, clients where they gave her, they did medical interventions on her without her permission. And I was on the phone with her. I said, I'm coming to the hospital right now. Um, and she just let them do, or she didn't know that they were doing, they were inserting something um, up her vagina, right? And and they didn't, she didn't know. Um, that That is discriminatory. That is, that is um, them believing that it was okay to do because this was in her best interest and she's too young to make her own decision right um so that's no i was on the phone with her and i'm sure the nurse was there while i was on the phone with her on speaker but that's a different story right um and we could talk about that birth um but so when we say advocate 
um, it's really important. Like your, your doula told you, Debbie, when you don't understand something, just say, hold on, give me a minute. Let me think about it. And if somebody's not in the room with you, call them. Um, I teach childbirth education. And for some reason, I can't remember the acronym, but and my doula partner would kill me right now. But that the um, thing is, you want to you wanna ask them, okay, so what are the risks? What are the, um, if they come in and they say that um, they want to do this medical intervention on you or whatever the case is, or they want to give you this type of medication, what are the risks of, of, of this medication? What are the alternatives of the medication? Um, hey, can I think about it for a second? Can you walk out the room, let me and my partner, let me and my loved ones talk about it, and then I'll give you an answer later? Do you need an answer right now? And usually if they say they don't need an answer right now, it's probably not an emergency. Take all the time you need. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that way, you know, you just have time to breathe and think it over. Um, so never feel like you need to give the doctors an answer right away. Because honestly and truly, if it is life or death, they're not going to give you a chance um, to, to, to kind of think about it. They're going to want to save your life. So if there is breathing room, take your time. Take your time and think about your answer. Think about what you want to do. And even if it's as simple, even if you say yes to the C-section, even if you say yes to the epidural or whatever it is, that's fine too. Just make sure that it was your decision and you had the chance to talk about it because there's so many implicit biases, right? Or if they don't want to give you pain meds because they feel as a, as a Black woman, you could take the pain. That's BS. Um, okay, and if you want pain meds, you could go on ahead and have it. And then Nerling could ask, and then I could answer the second question because I forgot it. <laughs> Wait, can you see that? <laughs> you know, I said, if you have anything else to say about advocacy, go ahead because I um, forgot the second question. I know, I forgot the second question. Okay, so yeah, um, advocacy is very, very important. Um, I mean, I myself as a nurse, I, I consider myself an advocate for my patient. My job is to make sure my patients um, needs are met. My job is to make sure my patient is heard um, and to whatever concern that they have is to relay that to the provider. And I'm like the like the, the liaison or intermediary between them and the, the doctor. Um, I mean, I, one, our, one of our jobs as nurses is to question a doctor's orders if we think they're wrong. Doctors are not perfect. They're human. Um, they make mistakes. And if I were to administer a medication and the doctor ordered a dose that's too high, I'm, um, you know, I'm at I'm at fault as well because I should have seen that and I know better, you know, better to question that order and not just go ahead and blindly give it. So um, my patients, um, I'm their advocate. I'm supposed to be the one to make sure that they get consent if some a procedure is supposed to be done, that they know that and they understand the good, the bad everything and before they say yes or no to that being done like you're crazy your story but you're that was crazy i don't even know um but advocacy advocacy is truly important and it's you know we have to work together like um like we've said before have people in your life um that you know know that you're going into the hospital know that you're getting this you know procedure done um you know and have their numbers you know readily available to call them you know to ask questions yes if, if someone who is a medical professional or nurse um, or doula you know doc you know whatever they are that's even better they have that knowledge and understanding but you need to have people in your life who know like your birth plan what you want and who can be there to advocate for you that's really good thank you so much and i like the fact that you touched on that nurses can um, even though they're providing direct care to you, they can be your advocates. I had amazing nurses. Sometimes we just, it's not something that's super common, especially if you're someone who frequents or have visited the ER, you don't have the best experiences with nurses. And so being able to have someone who's supposed to be by you maybe for eight hours, 21 or five days, right? Uh, and this person actually being your advocate is not... Uh, an idea in which we would naturally just process right off the cuff. And so this is really important for us to know that our nurses can be our advocates. And I believe um, I had one or two nurses that were my advocates before. Um, so thank you so much for that. And the last thing that I, I had mentioned was um, preeclampsia and high blood pressure, because that is something that is super common in um, the Black maternal community. And I truly believe that, um, you know, 
uh, women are not prepared for uh, the idea of when and how preeclampsia comes about in high blood pressure, because sometimes they can be um, synonymous uh, uh, with each other. And sometimes, you know, they can come very much so different. Like, for example, I had a very low risk pregnancy, um, but through, you know, actually pushing, um, I had, they thought I had preeclampsia and I did it. And I just ended up having high blood pressure for two to three weeks postpartum. Um, but that is something that I did not prepare for afterwards because I thought it was something before. And speaking to a lot of, um, you know, moms, especially new moms within the last five years, these are some things that they did not know of and did not prepare for. And so for our last topic, you know, um, how can we prepare for this? Is it something that can be prevented or do we track it and monitor it? And how do um, we manage it if this does come about? Uh, well, um, first, I mean, it's very important to take care of your body even before you're pregnant, um, I always tell women if uh, um, you know if you are if you are of childbearing age, you should be preparing your body, preparing your womb for you know when you do get pregnant. Um, you know, taking prenatals, but you know, exercising, eating right, um, you know, um, doing the right things. Um, you know, you know, in preparation of that, um, you should be going to you know when you're pregnant, you should be going to your visits regularly. Do not miss your appointments. If you have to reschedule, okay, but do not miss prenatal appointments. Um, you know, the doctors run tests. Every appointment you go to, you will have to give them urine. Like, I, you know, and I tell patients, if you're coming in, if you need to use the bathroom, here, here's the cup. So that, you know, you have, you know, you already um, have the urine. Um, and they, you know, check it for proteins and, you know, bacteria, different things in your urine to see if, you know, what's going on. Um, they do, so they do run tests. When you go to your ultrasound, they're checking the, the, you know, uh, as a bait, the growth of the child and everything. So don't miss those appointments because those, um, those tests, those things, diagnostic tests can, you know, be indicators of something is going on. Um, and that could let them know that something's going on. Also, you know, if you are not feeling well, if you feel like, you know, it's not right, you know, let your doctor know, call them up, you know, don't even wait till your appointment. Um, call the facility, call the doctor to let them know, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Um, you know, if you're like seeing swelling, um, headaches, severe headaches, you know, changes in your vision, like blurry vision, um, you know, bleeding is not necessarily related to preeclampsia, but any changes, in, you know, and things that don't seem normal, you should definitely um, verbalize it and let them know. Um. Those are all good tips. And I think that um, understanding what preeclampsia is, um, is the beginning of understanding how to deal with it. Um, and Darlene explained a lot of the symptoms and signs. Um, and that headache one is so key because um, we get a lot of headaches. Like people don't know that epidural can give you a headache or you just have a headache. You just gave birth. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, does it show up during pregnancy? Yes. But um, I think the most scariest part is when it's showing up during labor. Um, and uh, that's something that um, everyone should be aware of, especially as black women, because we harbor a lot of stress and we carry generational stress. Even if you feel like you don't have stress, baby girl, you are carrying stress as a, as a black woman. So um, regardless of how healthy we are, there is on, on some cellular level, like you're carrying more stress than the average white person. So understanding, um, good. Someone wrote that they're considering giving birth at home. Good idea. I'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> um, so understanding on um, working on ways to eliminate stress um, or to like get it as low as possible. Um, Nerling also touched on um, my favorite part is the stuff that comes before and preparing your body. When we think about um, preeclampsia, we have to think about the liver and the kidneys. Those are the, the organs that are being um 
I don't want to say destroy, but like those are the the things that matter when it comes to talk about um, preeclampsia. So when we're talking about being healthy, we're talking about protein, we're talking about calcium, we're talking about potassium. Those three nutrients are really important and are are tied to preeclampsia directly. So wanting to keep your protein up because that's what the baby needs to build their tissue and their spine and things like that. Um, uh, Potassium, when we think of potassium, we think of bananas, eat your bananas, whatever it is, you know, um, calcium. We need that uh, when we're in labor. And those are things that um, that really need um, that we really need for the baby to grow. So we need a little bit extra. Um, and a lot of this goes uh, when we talk about like fertility health, um, the quality of the egg, the quality of the sperm. So making sure that you're eating well way before, at least four to six months before you just, you're getting ready to get pregnant. Like you want to start doing the right things. Um, so that some of these could at least, so that we could get you to an area where you're at low risk and it's not necessarily a high risk. Cause can anything happen at birth? Hell yes. Anything can happen. We never know what's going to happen. Um, and that's, that's kind of why, you know, to play the devil's advocate, I know I'm, t I'm always against the hospitals, but that's what hospitals prepare for. They prepare for the worst. They don't prepare for the best. Um, if we could just get them to meet us in the middle, that would be really good. Um, but they're they're totally focused on preparing for the worst. So I think for us, where we can meet the hospitals in the middle is to prepare for the best and prepare our bodies um, beforehand. That's all I got. Right. When you were saying that tomorrow, I remember, uh, you know, saying like, the, you know, hospitals don't, you know, prepare for like easy births and, and things like that. I remember um, watching um, to show a Netflix called Here Comes a Midwife. And it shows, <laughs> see it, smiling? it shows the progression. I remember as I'm watching, it shows the progression from how births, you know, the nurses would go to the patient's home and these were nuns, nuns and, you know, nurses as well, going to the patient's homes when they were in labor, calling the nun, saying, hey, my wife's in labor, come and they would go get to their, the patient's home and they get everything that they have um, started from the home and it progressed to like birthing centers, like in the doctor's offices and then going into the hospital. And of course, many women, you know, ended up wanting to give birth in a hospital. It became the trend because you get away from your house. You know, things were very messy in your house, but now you can go to a hospital that's really clean and they have a doctor and they have nurses that can tend to you. You don't have to worry if you have kids and your family, you don't have to worry about them. You know, they're at home and you're in a hospital in a place where you can have, you know, the quiet and be by yourself and have your baby and not have to deal with all of that. And then, of course, with, you know, C-sections and just, you know what, let me just cut them open, get the baby out because it's a lot quicker, you know, and, you know, you can get it done and on and on to the next patient. So, you know, you, you can deliver at more, a lot more babies, make a lot more money and then, you know, and move on. So um, I just wanted to share that. It just triggered, triggered me when you said I was going to say that. Anyway. I was going to say that um, when I was in the hospital, I remember I was looking for my doctor and they were like, oh, yeah, um, you know, they'll get back to you. Well, it's it's a practice with multiple providers. And so I wanted to go in on the day that like my top two providers were there. I didn't like all 20 of them. Right. So that's like a, another thing I would always instruct people to go to a provider that's like one, maybe two people, not 15 or 20, because you don't know who you're going to get. It's a whole nother story. But um, I remember looking for my doctor and for that day and they were saying, oh, yeah, there's like 15 scheduled C-sections. So, you know, they'll get to you in between. I was like, what? So this is this is just what y'all do. This is just what y'all do. OK, no problem. I was like, I got to get out of here. But um, yeah. And I mean, again, no matter which way you give birth and how you give it is OK. But for the simple fact that this is just a practice and people just want or providers just want to do this as the first means of having you deliver your baby is an issue. Um, and so being able to advocate for yourself again and find people that can advocate for you is very important. And so um, I just wanted to add that in there. All right. We are so over time. Um, I just want to give another chance again, if anyone has any questions or comments to drop it in the chat, um, the chat was popping. Um, and so, you know, if there are no additional questions, 
then we can actually go into ending our session today. This was our third conversation around pregnancy, Black maternal health, um, breaking biases and stereotypes. And this was absolutely fun. And I enjoy being in this corner with you all. I'm, I've been opened up to a as whole- a mom. As a mom this time. You know, it's a beautiful thing to say. I was very scared of the process and getting into it. And now I'm just like, I'm flowing. And I have my some of my friends and people are just like, girl, you mad comfortable. You look good. It's been uh, interesting. That's awesome. You're killing it. Thank you, love. Thank you. And so to end today's session, there are no additional questions, but I do see comments in the chat. Thank you, Sandy. I do see questions. There are no questions in the chat, but there are still comments. So we'll um, just continue to interact with you all in the chat. But what I would like to do to end our session for today is for all three of us to go ahead and throw up our X's, um, which will illustrate us using our hashtag for today, which is hashtag break the bias. And we will all cross our arms to show our commitment in calling out the biases, smashing stereotypes, breaking inequality, and rejecting discrimination. And so on the count of three, with a smile, because we're breaking these biases and smashing these stereotypes as phenomenal women, um, I want us all to throw up our exes. So get ready, get ready. All right, so one, two, and three. All right. So again, thank you to the Haitian American Caucus, 67th Precinct Clergy Council and the Mayor's Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes for sponsoring this discussion around bias and discrimination in Black maternal health. Thank you again to our women's health coach, Tamar Innocent, and our registered nurse, um, women's and birth advocate, Nerlene St. St. Elme. Um, and again, I am your host, Debbie Esther Lewis, an organizer and educator, and we were so delighted to present this information to you all. Um, you can find uh, each one of us in different spaces. I'll go ahead and um, drop that now. You can find me at DebbieLewis.com or on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at the Debbie Lewis. Um, Tamar is at Tamar Innocent right, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and th here's her. Oh, okay, we have people in the background working, okay? So, <laughs> so that's where you can find Tamar. And you can find Nerlene at Life by Neural, okay? So that's where you can find us. Um, Someone has a question in the chat. Okay, let me move it. Let's see. Um, one of you mentioned something about the sperm being healthy as well. This is something we don't hear too much. It's It always centers around the woman being healthy. Yes, that is big. Um, and I won't speak to it too much because we have two... Yeah very educated women here who can speak to it, but I think it's absolutely um, important. It is important for the male to be healthy as well. And them to also watch what they're eating, how they're exercising and all that good stuff. So um, I'll let Tamar and Nerlene respond. So it's very important, right? Cause I, I've had the pleasure of kind of um, walking people through, um, through for the fertility process and understanding that the man's sperm is just as important. You want to make sure that he's not down in um, drinking a lot of alcohol, drinking a lot of coffee, um, just as much as it is important for the woman. Um, and I won't get too because like I'm not a I'm not a chemistry nerd or whatever classes or whatever. But like the 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 egg can can eliminate and take over. If I might be saying this wrong, they can't. Um, destroy like some malfunctions, um, chromos chromosomal abnormalities that the sperm may have. Um, and you'll never like know it. 
um, but sometimes the sperm may not be as functional, right? So like if you're having trouble getting pregnant and you're diagnosed with infertility, um, one of the steps would be for, for um, the providers at the fertility clinic to actually test and analyze the sperm. So they want to check for motility like are the sperms like moving and swimming the way they should be the morphology which i think is like um like it's shaped like it's shaped well and that it's moving well and then there's a third one that i don't remember but um it's just as important um and sometimes we don't movement move okay movement motility and morphology right i don't know yeah, that's the next well, well, yeah. quantity, <laughs> quantity the amount of sperm, yeah. So the quantity, the movement, and of course you need, you know, yeah, like you say, the shape, how it's shaped. But yeah, um, men's um, health overall is very important. It affects the sperm um, health um, and the quality of sperm that they're producing. Um, you know, they need their vitamins too. They need their vitamin C, their CoQ10. They need to make sure that, you know, they're eating the right things. Um, like Tamar said, that they're not drinking or smoking or, you know, all the time, you don't think about that, but it affects, you know, the production of their sperm and it could affect, you know, their children as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I was gonna say. <laughs> that sums it up. <laughs> Thank you, um, Assembly Member Visha is in the, is in the chat. Thank you. You're welcome, Sandy. All right, so um, the only thing I will say, and I'll just add on to this, is make sure that if you are going this route with a partner to get sperm, make sure they're exercising, okay? It's very, very important, okay? Everybody works out, okay? The whole family. <laughs> Everybody go work out together. All right, eat well together. Movement right. is so important. All right, eat well together, exercise together. Okay. Or hire me. I, I mean, shameless plug. I am a women's health coach and I am dedicated to working with women before they get pregnant. Oh, oh boxes or briefs. Remember that that's important too. That you know, they're not wearing listen, those tight pants. <laughs> yeah. See, yes, starting <laughs> we have to end yes in here making. <laughs> Okay, okay. Those are very important. You know what? That should be the next topic too. We need to talk about that because, you know, sometimes the stress is on. Hi, Elias. Sometimes the stress, the stress is on women and it's not all our fault. I'm just saying. No, no shade. Okay. It's absolutely true. Yep. All right. So um, again, let's end for real this time. Um, thank you to everyone that participated in the comments and the chats. We appreciate you. This has been an amazing conversation. We threw up our exes. We broke our biases. We broke the stereotypes. And we definitely engaged with you all. Um, please uh, check out hackglobal.org um, for more information on uh, sessions uh, and conversations like this and others. Look, Tamar is like, good night, dropping the light. So hackglobal.org, H-A-C-G-L-O-B-A-L.org for more conversations like this and other related topics. I'm, I was laughing because Assembly Member Rodney said boxers. Um, yes, I agree. Also because they're actually really comfortable for me too, so. I was gonna say that, I wear them comfortable. Hold on, yeah, we're the, we're we're the boxes. Boxes. That's what I yes. wore around the house when I was pregnant. That's the only thing that fit, and I was not gonna buy bigger dogs. Like, definitely, you know, for the whole family, you know, the whole family can get involved. <laughs> <laughs> it works. The whole family works out together. The whole family wears boxers together. This is new. Why not? I love it. All right, ladies, it was a pleasure. Have a good night. And don't forget to continue to throw your exes up. Boxers for all. <laughs> <laughs>